I think my answer is, is that this is a problem which is growing in its intensity, that people do need to do work experience in order to get a foot in the door. And I think I, as a partner in a law firm, need to take seriously, if we are having people on work experience, that we need to consider what we're getting out of them and whether we should be paying them. I think it's almost as simple as that. But I had a, um, somebody on work experience with me in the summer who we did pay because we were going to be paid for the things that she did. And I think there's a matter of fairness there that the profession needs to take on board and, and not you know, create some sort of modern day slavery. A lot of firms will still say we do work experience here, but you need to be related to an employee or a client. And <laughs> yeah. they don't do that. You know, they're not doing that for malicious reasons, actually. But the effect of it is that when they're then assessing people for uh, privileges, for training contracts, what have you, they are looking in the bloodline, essentially, because they're only themselves giving it to people that are, are in some way related. So there is that issue. The unpaid issue, I think, depends a lot on the length. So if it's a relatively short placement of one to two weeks, I'm actually quite comfortable with people being having all their expenses covered in order to do that one to two weeks so that they can do it because the access, I think, is very important. If it's longer than that, then I do think they absolutely should be paid. There's a scheme we run in, in politics called the Speaker's Parliamentary Placement Scheme in which corporate firms have donated money in order that people who want to work in politics another area where you need to work unpaid for six months, nine months before you can get your foot on the ladder, are paid the start of the parliamentary pay scale to work for an MP Monday to Thursday and for the House of Commons on Friday. So it is possible to get corporate firms to donate to that. And incidentally, those are firms that aren't involved in politics, they've got an interest in it, but um, they're doing it because they believe it is the right thing to do. Um, we take work experience people on first come, first served, and, and sometimes they have to be very persistent, but we think persistence is good for legal aid lawyers. Um, and, and as with you, we, we pay them when we do something for which we get paid. Sometimes it's just shadowing, you know, just going around with people to see what they do, um, in which case you know, they get a lot of input um, talking to the, to the lawyer, but they're not actually doing anything um, for which we're getting paid. But yes, of course people should be paid if they're, if they're doing um, work for which the firm is getting paid. Um, I, I suppose one other thing that I want to say, and perhaps I should have said it earlier, is that I, despite the fact that, that everyone, you know, an awful lot of people who start on this process, they really want to be lawyers, um, it's always worth bearing in mind the other things that you can do. You know, a law degree is, it has, a, has a sort of general utility um, that a lot of people appreciate. You know, you're taught to be analytical and you're taught to be articulate and to understand evidence and so on and so forth. Um, and that, that goes all the way through. I mean, if it wasn't for the amount of money that you spend on getting as far as the LPC or whatever, you know, you, you are getting a very useful sort of training in transferable skills. Not that that's a great consolation if what you really want to be is to be a lawyer. Um, but the other thing that you need to understand is that in this country, unlike a lot of jurisdictions, a huge amount of legal work is done by non-lawyers. Not just non-lawyers in law firms, but non-lawyers not in law firms. Um, the, the, the amount of work that is reserved work that only lawyers can do is really quite limited. Um, and there's a great deal that you can do um, as an unqualified lawyer. Now, I realise, once again, that probably sounds, yeah, well, it's easy for me to say, isn't it? But I don't think you should, you know, anyone who really wants to, to be a lawyer and do law can do so um, in a whole variety of different ways, either by qualifying in different routes um, or by just getting loads of experience. Um, in, in any, in any um, law firm, you will have highly experienced, unqualified people working at exactly the same level as the qualified people and being treated with the same respect and so on. I just wanted to flag up an issue that I think that is an opportunity in the coming years, is that if we're talking about social mobility in the legal aid profession, you know, one, of the, one of the many obstacles we're facing is, 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 the, is the pressure that the sector is under and the training contracts are becoming fewer and fewer between, because the legal aid lawyers and the legal aid firms are becoming fewer and far in between. And, and the downward pressures on legal aid expenditure and on legal costs have created the, 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 this, this explosive growth of paralegal work. Um, and the Legal Education Training Review and the SRA response to it are, are partly addressing this. But there is an awful amount of 
scuffling going on between all of the various interest sectors, between the Law and the SRA, between the SRA and Silex and so on and so on. Uh, there's the Paralegal Institute, there's the Institute of Paralegals. It's a real mess, this sector. And yet the truth is, is that many aspirant uh, legal aid lawyers will end up having got so far down the road, but not all of the way, with big debts, and they'll be working in that sector. And I think the biggest thing that we could do as a profession, as a society, is to see that sector uh, properly regulated with proper, flexible career paths built through. And that would mean that the, the risk that we take in terms of debts wouldn't be an all or nothing gamble. There would be various levels of work, always with the possibility of moving on to, to the next level. But that will require the professions to lay aside their shorter term professional interests in who gets to regulate, who gets to tax this sector, and building proper flexibility through those, up through the levels of legal work. Law firms should become more used to employing people other than a trainee, a trainee if they can offer a trainee, if they like them and they keep them, and so on and so on through the sector. So we as a group need to be very interested in this debate that's coming out of the Legal Education Trade Review. It's time for, for a rethink on a lot of levels, and I'm interested to hear what you're doing here at South Bank and the Liverpool University are training people in social welfare at a time when legal aid jobs are going out of the window. They've got a social welfare model. They've got a law clinic who are doing immigration <coughs> work for things that are not within scope. And I think those things are valuable because they will create social welfare lawyers who firms like ours may be able to employ at some level. And I, I entirely agree. <coughs> The vested interests of the professions, uh, that's, that's a bigger fish to fry, I suspect, but you know, Lucy may have, have a view on that. I mean, I, I agree with you about new ways of working. I agree with you that we need to make it possible for, me to move, for, for people to move through the, the various different layers. Um, I'm slightly wary about the idea of it being sort of terribly regulated, because then I think it falls into the same trap of, you know, marriage, common law marriage, unmarried, living together, you know, where you know, people having different choices. Um, what I do think is something that, that we're not, uh, not really discussing now um, is um, what's going to replace legal aid. Because one of the things about, about legal aid law is that it's been a bit like, you know, that thing about boiling a frog. If you bring, bring the temperature up gradually, the frog doesn't notice that it's being boiled alive. Um, and, uh, so, um, and, then, and then suddenly, you know, the, 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 the water's all, you know, the, the, the frog is gone. Um, and, but, but the fact, you know, if, if, most, if most social welfare law has been legal aid law, and legal aid isn't available for social welfare law anymore, other things are going to come in its place, where people are going to be paying um, a certain amount, or they're going to be getting philanthropic philanthropic funding um, to help them do various things um, and and I think that there's going to be a, a, a surge of really imaginative ways of providing very low cost but still good quality services to people who used to get legal aid um, and I would say to um, a, a group of people um, most of whom um, are uh, very much younger than me and probably all of whom know how to tweet which I don't, that you are in absolutely prime position. I say this over and over again to people who are aspiring to be lawyers or people who are young lawyers, you are in the prime position to look at the way that lawyers provide services and to think, well, that's a ridiculous waste of time and money doing it like that. Why don't you sweep away half of that stuff and do it like this, do it cheaper, do it better, do it just as professionally. I'm not talking about online law, but I am talking about using technology. Um, because even with legal aid, there's a huge amount of unmet need. It always has been. Even when legal aid was at its peak, huge amount of unmet need. Um, and those people need services. The people who, who aren't eligible for legal aid need services. People who were eligible for legal aid need services. And finding new ways to do it, I think, is going to be absolutely the future for, for the legal profession. And it's something that you are all much better qualified to do um, than people of my generation. Who